Y creo que también... In addition to that, if we go back a little to the beginning of what we are talking about, much American media is simply not speaking the truth. I mean, Cuba is an important issue, especially for the media in Florida, and they have a focus on specific issues. So we are also trying to talk about the nuances, the grays in those gaps that are not covered by most media. It is our job to say what they are not saying, because obviously you can find news about human rights violations in Cuba, but then what? And so we go back to what we were talking about at the beginning. How much of this news that talks about human rights violations in Cuba examines how U.S. policies have affected the impoverishment of the population. None. None of them talk about that. They only talk about the role of the state, the role of the police, repression, etc., human rights violations. And they talk about people, and this gets my attention, marginalized in some way, though they don't use this term, but they do not talk about how much the situation of crisis in the country is generated or furthered United States policy. It is worsened by those people who supposedly are trying to promote democracy and human rights in Cuba. In fact, we know that human rights really matter very little to them because they would not maintain basically a genocidal policy against the Cuban people if our well-being did matter to them. So there are many gray areas, many areas of manipulation and polarization within the Cuban reality. And Belly of the Beast tries to tell those unexamined stories. It especially tries to show that complex reality for an audience that is not Cuban but American. And we try to talk about the issues that are essentially left out of the mainstream. So what the mainstream media really does then is select what they think qualifies as important about what is going on in Cuba. There really is no objectivity whatsoever. So does it work? It works. Because when they ask the Biden administration about the possibility of returning to Obama's policies or of reaching an accord with the Cuban government, what is the first thing they say? Well, the human rights situation in Cuba has to improve in order for the United States to better relations or to open a new dialogue with the government of Cuba. And I think, wow, how strange, how weird. These human rights issues are not taken into account in the negotiations with Saudi Arabia. That is to say, at the beginning of March, the American press were all talking about a new report, that which revealed that indeed Mohammed bin Salman had ordered the assassination of Jamal Khashoggi, a journalist who worked for an American newspaper, because it simply did not suit MBS to have him around. And the Biden administration, the same Biden administration that claims that it has to wait for the human rights situation in Cuba to improve before opening a dialogue with the Cuban government, says we condemn the act, but we will continue negotiating with Saudi Arabia, because Saudi Arabia is important to the United States. So you don't care so much about human rights when you negotiate not only with Saudi Arabia, but also with Egypt, with Israel, with Colombia, with a long list of countries with human rights violations. The human rights situation is said to be really important to resuming the dialogue with the Cuban government or to taking Cuba off the list of terrorist countries, even though the United States knows that the government of Cuba does not sponsor terrorism, and that is the most ridiculous thing I have ever heard in my life. Nevertheless, that is what is written about in the media, and the government takes advantage of this when it comes to providing reasons for maintaining the blockade and for refusing to hold talks with the Cuban government. 
As to the question of what Cuban Americans think about the situation in Cuba, I mean, it's very interesting. What other American citizens of different backgrounds, say Russian Americans, Chinese Americans, or I don't know, any other nationality, or Chilean Americans, are asked what they think about the relationship that they have with their country of origin? Evidently, they are not asked that question. However, Cubans, well, not all Cuban Americans, but a hardcore group, let's say a reactionary core of Cuban Americans, really has power and influence on the votes that are made in Florida. They are difference makers because there is Marco Rubio saying, well, if the Biden administration does not follow the Trump line with Cuba, we are going to make them pay. We are going to punish them. And what are they going to punish them with? Votes. With votes in Florida and the politicians know it. I mean, Trump bet on Florida to win the 2016 elections, and it worked for him. When Trump's policies or his performance were questioned during his term, people said the worst things about him, that he was wrong, that he was acting incompetently, except with Cuba and with Venezuela. With Cuba and Venezuela, whatever Trump did was applauded. The president was right because... Imagine, with a dictatorship, we cannot negotiate. Not with communism, socialism, not with all these ghosts that are invented by the U.S. media. So the question here is if the Biden administration is really willing to assume the political cost. Because Cuban-American congressmen from the most reactionary sector of Florida are telling you, if you follow or move towards the policies of the Obama administration, an administration you are part of, we are going to make you pay for it with votes. And in two years, there are elections. In short, whether or not Joe Biden is willing to pursue the policies that President Obama pursued is something that time will tell. His most recent statements on the matter do not leave us with a good feeling. I would also like to emphasize the issue of the sanctions against Cuba. The hostile policy towards Cuba is not limited to Republicans alone. That is to say, almost 60 years of history have passed. There have been several Democratic and Republican administrations, and all have acted in the same way. I mean, the line against Cuba has always been the same. It doesn't matter if you are red or blue, the line towards Cuba has always been the same. A line that Obama said had not worked. Not that we have changed our ultimate goal, Obama said, but that we should change the strategy. I don't know. It doesn't seem very hopeful at the moment. I believe that the greatest impact of Obama's policies towards Cuba was felt in the private sector. The private sector that Marco Rubio raised in one of his speeches, and which that same hardcore group in Miami likes to champion in a certain way. I think that is where the greatest impact of Obama's policies towards Cuba was felt, because there was a greater influx of tourism. Cuba, at some point, became the hub of some of the main events that were happening globally. And after Obama's visit to the country, Cuba became a trending topic. And since the country was undergoing an economic opening in the private sector, they were the main sector to benefit from the change in policy. And it had a domino effect on the rest of the population. The people who had a rental home or property benefited from it. People who rented to U.S. citizens through Airbnb or people who drove cars and gave you a ride all over the Malacón and transported thousands of tourists a day who came on the big cruise ships to Cuba, or the person who owned a restaurant or a café that began to have a much higher influx of foreigners who came to visit. 
Musical groups that were hired to entertain in those privately owned restaurants all benefited. Privately owned businesses were the ones that had the greatest capacity to respond to the avalanche of tourists that were arriving in Cuba at that time. And this is shown in the second episode of The War on Cuba. A person who does not depend directly on tourism also benefits because the person who had a restaurant hires him to deliver because he has a bicycle and then he receives money from a person who is working on the front line, let's say, of the impact of the economic boom which the country was experiencing at the moment. It is a chain effect. For example, you have a house, and with the single room you rent, it is not enough. So you need to expand the property, and you hire builders. If you want to build a bar, you hire carpenters. You also hire people to help you with all the services that you offer on the property. The economic impact has an avalanche and a domino effect on the rest of the Cuban population. That has been stopped dead in its tracks by Donald Trump's policies. And I wouldn't say that Trump just rolled back the policies that had been implemented during Obama's second term. He went far beyond and made it much worse. Trump did what no other president in the history of the United States has done, which is to activate the Title III of the Helms-Burton Law. That's why I am so conscious about using the term blockade and not embargo. Because not only does it affect trade between two countries, it affects Cuba's trade with other countries. And all this damage is being seen now in the absence of tourism. With the sanctions that prevent remittances or being able to travel to the United States and more. It is being seen in the private sector. Of course, eventually it has a domino effect on all the other sectors, but the private sector is the most affected. If you want to know how the policies really affect the private sector, the sector that the reactionary bloc from Florida supposedly wants to empower, Take a microphone or a notebook and go out to the businesses, knock on the doors and say, how did it go with Obama and how are you doing now? Or, how did it go with Trump and how are you doing now with Biden? Because there has been no talk of reversing or going back on any of Trump's policies, at least for the moment. And the inclusion of Cuba on the list of terrorist countries became effective during the first days of the Biden administration. So up to this point, you can't talk about a difference between the Biden administration and the Trump administration. So far, the policies are the same. They're all still there.